Hello and welcome to this episode of Felonious, a podcast where we discuss the realm of true crime. From chilling cold cases to the wild and wacky, we'll explore it all with a perfect blend of seriousness and humour. My name is Emma and I'm Nazia. To keep up to date with what's coming up, be sure to follow us on Instagram at felonious.pod and visit our website feloniouspod.com. We hope you enjoy this episode, so let's get to it. Yeah, thanks anyone who listened to the last episode. Yes, thank you if you made it through all three parts. It's heavy. Yeah. We jumped in at the the deep end there. Yeah, we did. It was fun though. It was. It was um it was intense, but it was yeah, you could call it fun. Like it wasn't <laughs> not fun. You, you just yeah. <laughs> fun and true crime and Charles Savage. But yeah. no, it it was a good one. I I hope um people enjoyed it or if they made it through three parts, I certainly hope they enjoyed it. Yeah. And if you haven't listened to those episodes, please check them out. Yeah. Even though um, the episodes are recorded in advance, we do welcome feedback. I think in one of the episodes I said it doesn't matter if you give us feedback, but no, we we do appreciate feedback. Yeah, we like feedback. Yes, we do. So before we get into today's case, you found some interesting bits of true crime. I did. On the interwebs. On on the Instagrams. Yes. Yeah, I follow this Instagram account called A History of Dogs and I recommend you all follow them as well. And they, they quite often post old articles from uh, the likes of the New York Times. And in this particular case, I have an article right in front of me. It goes, Dog goes to jail for tooting horn of auto. In Lansing, Michigan, in America, on the March 14th, um, this was published in 1936, a bulldog went to jail today because he blew the horn of his owner's automobile. Police who investigated the tooting of a horn after it had continued for half an hour found the dog, one forepaw planted on the button. The dog's master had left it in the car while he went shopping. The dog was placed in a cell at police headquarters to be held until claimed by the owner. I hope he got lots of treats. I hope so too. Plus it's, you know, it's not the dog's fault. No, he just wanted to go. He's got places to go, you know. Yeah. Stuff to sniff, people to meet. And treats to eat. And yeah, breakfast, lunch and dinner to be getting on with. Yes, and snacks in between. Yeah. And my second find is from the same account, and it's another uh, newspaper article from the New York Times in 1908. This one's hilarious. (laughs) Oh, God, the text is really small on my computer. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, how do I make this bigger? (laughs) Okay. Do you want me to read it out? Oh, yeah, you do it. Okay. Let's see if I have any luck. Meanwhile, my... Dog-sized cat, Lockie, is trying to be an a-hole again. I can I can do this. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> dog, a fake hero, pushes children into the Seine to rescue them and win beefsteaks. Special correspondence, the New York Times, Paris, January 22nd. Apropos of the decision of M. Lemon to employ dog auxiliaries for the patrol of lonely beats in the outskirts of Paris. A good story is now doing the rounds concerning a splendid Newfoundland which was a candidate at one of the recent field trials. The dog is the property of a man who lives on the banks of the Seine, just outside Paris. Some time ago, a child playing on the river bank fell into the water and was in imminent danger of being drowned. The dog, hearing the cries and the splashing, leaped over two hedges, ran down the bank and plunged into the stream just in time to rescue the little victim. 
Naturally, the brave animal was made much of, and the father of the child, by way of recompense, presented him a succulent beefsteak. Two days later, another child fell into the water and was rescued by the dog. The lifesaver received the same caresses and another beefsteak. Up to this point, there was nothing extraordinary, but rescues became more and more frequent. Hardly a day passed and that some unfortunate infant was brought safely to the bank by the dog after an involuntary bath. It began to be suspected that the neighbourhood was being haunted was haunted by a mysterious criminal and a special watch was inaugurated. Then the truth came out. It was the dog, the noble lifesaver himself, that was the guilty one. Whenever he saw a child playing on the edge of the stream, he promptly knocked it into the water and then nonetheless promptly jumped into the rescue. He had thus established for himself a profitable source of revenue. <laughs> Very clever. Yeah. I mean, those poor kids. But he's not really a fake hero. He was still saving them. Yeah. He just wanted a beefsteak in return. Yeah. But what if... I don't want to go too morbid, actually. What if he didn't save a child? Uh, yeah. Well, what was that child doing at the edge of the river? That's what I've got to ask. Yeah, but back in those days, people... Kids ran around, people left doors open. Yeah, I'm always going to be on the dog's side, so... <laughs> yeah, that's fair enough. But very, very clever. Yeah, and from 1908. Yeah, beef can't have been that cheap back then either. No. Yeah, that must have been really fancy for that dog. No wonder he was chucking children in the river. Exactly. Screw your kids, you've probably got about 13 of them. <laughs> <laughs> Give me your beef steaks. <laughs> yeah. Oh... Maybe we should do an episode on dogs one day. A palate cleanser episode. Yeah, I wanted to do the... Um, uh, it was really depressing, though, about um, dogs being stolen in the UK. Oh, yeah. That is on our list. Yeah. Isn't it? Because um, I don't know about France, but in Sweden, a lot of people don't know that that's a big thing in the UK. Yeah, I don't think we know about... Uh, well, we. I say we. I, I don't think the French... Um, seem to know about it i don't think so it's just something that doesn't happen in sweden like people don't go around stealing people's dogs no in france i think it's the same like from what i've seen people take good care of their dogs and people don't really have a reason well no one has a reason to steal a dog no people don't really have the motive to steal dogs no not at all from from what i understand but yeah, our, our little island is a bit bit fucked up when it comes to animals, isn't it? Not just that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's a lot fucked up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is. I mean, France isn't that much better, but yeah, anyway. We won't go into that right now. <laughs> well, let, let's just like go back to the 70s yeah. for our episode, shall we? <laughs> yeah, we love 70s true crime. yeah. We didn't mean to go do an, another 70s crime, but um, just happened to be the one that we picked. Yeah. <laughs> and it's an interesting topic. Yeah. So what are we going to discuss today? Well, we're going to discuss the crime behind the psychological phenomenon, which is Stockholm Syndrome. And this crime is a bank robbery turned hostage situation which ironically occurred in Stockholm in August of 1973. The robbery took place over six days and it was the first criminal event to be broadcasted live on the Swedish television. And this year marks the 50th anniversary of the bank drama, so... Wow. Do you know what? Go on. Can I say we're record? I don't, well, don't know when we're going to release this, but we're recording in August. Yeah, isn't it? It's nearly 50 years to the day. Yeah. I think it might be slightly over, but... It, well, it's, we're in the month. How yeah. crazy is that? I know, right? I, di I didn't even know when um, I was typing up the notes for this. Like, it didn't occur to me that it was 50 years. Yeah, that's crazy. Mm. It's good timing. I mean, good timing on our part. Yeah. <laughs> to pick <pick> this. <laughs> yeah. I mean, no, we planned it all along. <laughs> we're so organised. 
Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I should have put that in a disclaimer. We're not very organised. No, we really aren't. As I said, we don't know when we're going to actually release this episode, but just to be impressed by the fact that we are recording. <laughs> but it will be released in 2023. <laughs> we hope. Yeah, we hope so. <laughs> Maybe the last day. Who knows? Yeah. <laughs> Happy New Year. <laughs> um, right. Yeah, This uh, there's going to be a lot of Swedish names in terms of the people involved and locations. And I don't know any Swedish. Yeah, so you'll get to hear my Swedish Cockney accent and Nazia's French Cockney accent butchering the Swedish names and uh, and the English translations. Yeah, I'm really sorry. I'm just going to basically ask you to help me out with the pronunciations. Yeah. I'll, I'll try and learn them, remember them. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I'll do the same. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> well, you've got a better chance than I do. <laughs> so we should mention that there are details of sexual and domestic assault and other traumatic events that we'll mention as well. Yeah, there'll be some um, like just sensitive topics touched on throughout the case. As usual, we don't support the actions of these criminals and we fully respect the victims involved. We're not experts and we just enjoy talking about crime. And the research for this one was gathered from a range of news articles and the book Six Days in August by David King, which was a pretty good book. Had a lot of chapters. Lots of chapters. <laughs> but it is, I, th I thought it was very well written. It goes into a lot of detail, but it's a good read. I, I definitely recommend it to anyone. Yeah, I do as well. And it's easy to read, apart from the Swedish names. <laughs> There's not really any documentaries on this that we found, are there? No, but if listeners know of any, please do let us know and we'll check them out. But I had a look on YouTube and there was nothing on the streaming services that I could find, apart from the biopic of Clark Olofsson, who was one of the culprits involved, you'll find out. Yeah, I couldn't really find anything. No, I couldn't, which is quite interesting. Because mm. it's quite a massive event, if you think about it, you know, in the context of things. Yeah. I think there's lots of uh, Swedish documentaries, but uh, yeah. that's no good for you because you won't be able to understand them. No, exactly. <laughs> no. My laptop keeps freezing and uh, it, it's recording, but I'm just so nervous. I hope it's recording okay. <laughs> Okay. We'll just carry on and find out later, I guess. I uninstalled all of my Sims games just to... <laughs> I was like, I haven't played The Sims in like three months. Just uninstall every impact expansion pack and game. Can you make people have, like, can you control people to have their own podcasts inside the game? Probably. I'm sure there's an update for that. Maybe in the new newer version in Sims 4 or 5. They're going to come out with 5, aren't they? Are they Are they still doing it? Oh my god. Yeah, they're still making it. They made Sims 4 free, the base game. Um, and I think they've announced that there's a fifth one. Oh, okay. It's crazy. I used to use that cheat that used to give you unlimited money. Motherload. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Shall I start? Yeah, you can start. So this robbery happened on the 23rd of August in 1973 and it took place in Stockholm in Credit Banken in a square called Normalmstory and it was Stockholm's financial district so it was a really busy area in Stockholm. That a muscular man wearing a grey sweatshirt, makeup, a lady's wig and blue tinted sunglasses walked into the bank. He was carrying a bag which contained a map of Stockholm a road atlas, transistor radio, rope, walkie-talkies, fake passports, clothes, shoes, two hats, wool socks, hair dye, an extra wig, wires, fuses, blasting caps and explosives pastes. Wow. He's putting a Charles Sabraj to shame already. <laughs> yeah. With all that gear. <laughs> yeah. And he had no attaché case, just a canvas bag. No, no crocodile skin attaché case. <laughs> Who needs that? 
<laughs> An old lady held the door open for this guy, and he made his way to the lobby. Nobody paid him much attention whatsoever. He joined a queue of people, put the bag he was carrying on the floor, unzipped his sweatshirt, and took out a submachine gun, and fired into the ceiling and shouted, The party has just begun! Can you do that in a Swedish accent, please? <laughs> I'm joking. No you don't have to. <laughs> I'm not going to offend my Swedish friends by doing that. <laughs> I've got the voice of like, I know he's not even anywhere close to Swedish, but um, Arnold Schwarzenegger. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not going to attempt the accent either. <laughs> <laughs> He pulled the transistor radio out of his bag and rock music began to play. He went behind one of the counters and stopped near a woman who had ducked under a desk. He shouted at her to get up and instructed one of the male employees of the bank to take a knife and a rope from the bag and tie the woman up. He tied two other women by the wrists and ankles. The rope used was a clothesline and the employee, under the threat of being shot, had to redo the knots to make them tighter all the while, listening to loud rock music and telephones ringing in the background. The gunman would quickly change from laughing to shouting and seemed like he was high on drugs. A radio dispatch alerted police patrol cars to the scene and a large group of spectators had gathered across the street. One of the first police officers on the scene, Torgny Wallström, entered the bank with his pistol and took cover behind a counter. He saw the man with the submachine gun who was holding a young woman to act as a shield. The two other women, who were tied up by their ankles and wrists, were beside the assailant. He tried to move forward, but the gunman fired a shot in his direction. Volström jumped back and over a counter and found shelter in a safe deposit room. A group of bank employees were already hiding in there. Four other police officers had accessed the building via an alternative access. One of them was Inspector Ingemar Varpfeldt, a 57-year-old plainclothes detective and former bodyguard for the Prime Minister's children. He had worked for Stockholm Police for 31 years. Varpfeldt took some stairs down to the lobby, passing other officers. He took shelter behind a marble column and took out his pistol. He saw the gunman 20 feet away. The assailant had not seen Vapafelt, but the woman he was using as a shield did and screamed. The gunman asked Vapafelt in English if he was a police officer, to which he replied yes and instructed him to drop his weapon. The gunman dropped to one knee and fired his gun. He shot Vapafelt in his right hand. Vapafelt retreated back up the staircase. He believed the gunman was trying to shoot his head as his hand was at shoulder height when he was shot. It was the first time the officer had been injured on the job. At the time of the robbery, there was very little crime in Sweden. There was free healthcare, free higher education, free childcare, and pensions were guaranteed for life. The Prime Minister was Olaf Palmer, and his party, the Social Democrats, had been in power since the 1930s. The party helped build Sweden into one of the wealthiest, and developed economies in the world. Sweden was known worldwide for its output of technology, high quality goods, and the pop band ABBA. Mamma mia, <laughs> here we go. Sorry. <laughs> money, money, money. <laughs> However, this started to change in the early 1970s. The currency suffered with the stock market crash. The cost of living increased dramatically, and unemployment increased. Deja vu, anyone? No, I don't think that's ever happened in, in our history, no, has no, it? No, no, it's all no good. especially not, not recently. More and more police cars were gathering outside Credit Banking in Normam's Tory, while the crazed gunman inside the bank was behind the telecounter, accompanied by the three tied-up women. The gunman demanded to know the layout of the building and asked a lot of questions, but didn't demand cash or any valuables in the deposit boxes. The bank employee, Bo Nilsson, who tied up the three women, was ordered to look for more police officers hiding in the building. He returned and was yelled at and accused of lying about not finding any police officers and was threatened that he would be the first one shot if anything happened. He was then ordered to find someone in authority as the bank robber wanted to talk. 
Bo found some police officers on the bank director's floor who instructed Bo to tell the gunman to surrender, put down the gun and walk out with his hands up. Unsurprisingly, he didn't fancy that and told the officers to find someone else who had a better command of Engli- the English language and remained upstairs. I'm sorry, can you just like go and do your our job for us? <laughs> yeah, just go, just go and tell him to put his gun down. Be all right. Yeah. <laughs> Morgan Rielander appeared on the scene, a 32-year-old plainclothes inspector who worked in the Drug Enforcement Division at the Swedish National Bureau of Investigation. He was with his colleagues in a car outside. He borrowed a gun from one of them, which he placed under his belt concealed by his T-shirt and jacket. He checked with the officers outside the building for an update and then used a a neighbouring staircase to access the building on the second floor where he saw four bank employees crouched on the ground. They told him that the gunman was down in the lobby and he made his way there. The gunman was speaking English to the women tied up when Morgan yelled if that was the only language he spoke. The gunman then told Morgan to reveal himself, asked if he was a police officer and for his name. Morgan lifted up his jacket to show he had no weapon. The gun-wielding rubber then stated his demands. He wanted 3 million Swedish crowns, which is 30 million crowns today or 2 million euros. And he wanted Sweden's most infamous criminal, Clark Olofsson, to be released from prison and brought to the bank. But who was Clark Olofsson? And why did the crazed gunman want him at the bank? Clark Olofsson was born on the 1st of February 1947. He lived in a single-parent household until the age of eight when he was placed into a number of foster homes. In his teenage years, he would earn money by selling vodka and had a habit of stealing cars. He then moved on to robbing banks. According to a Swedish newspaper, he was one of the country's most influential opinion makers, but foremost, he was a hardened criminal and notorious for escaping prison. If you do not risk anything, he says, then you won't gain anything. Sounds like someone else we've spoken about. Yeah, I wonder, I'd love to know what the success rate was for like top criminals to escape prisons in that time. Probably very high, I would think. (laughs) Yeah, seemed quite easy to do back then. Yeah, I imagine bribing a police officer was quite easy as well. Yeah, yeah. Just uh, reminded me of a specific detail that we're going to mention later on. Okay, I can't remember what that was. I don't want to give it away. (laughs) Okay, we'll find out. (laughs) Yeah. Seven years prior, in 1966, he burgled a sports store in New Shopping with a friend. They were caught by police, but one of the officers was shot and died 16 days later. Even though Clark's friend confessed to the shooting of the officer, the police blamed Clark, who'd led them on a four-week manhunt. He was popular with the press with his mocking of the police. He would do interviews and then mail them to the authorities and he went to a cinema in a suit and made a show of buying a ticket, disappearing after and watching the police chaotically search for him. Uh, That's something Sabraj would have done as well, I reckon. Yep. In May 1973, he received a six-year sentence for aggravated robbery, illegally possessing weapons and stealing cars. His time in prison was spent reading and studying a university correspondence course, with his favourite topic being philosophy and the Renaissance. He held press conferences and started a profitable newspaper, The Concrete Paper, with his fellow inmates, but it was shut down by authorities as it criticised the prison system. But who exactly was the gunman inside the bank? At first he was suspected as being a terrorist. He didn't take the money and run. He didn't speak Swedish but English and he appeared not to understand Swedish. The police assumed he was from either the Middle East, Northern Ireland or West Germany due to the numerous radical left-wing groups that had formed after the arrest of revolutionaries in 1972 and the terrorist attack at the Munich Olympic Games. The fact is, the gunman was Swedish. Jan Erik Olsen, or Jana for short, a 32-year-old safecracker. He had committed many crimes in the past, including burglary, 
theft and grand larceny in 1972. He was serving a three-year prison sentence when he walked into Credit Banken. He was on temporary release for good behaviour. Born in 1941, Jana grew up with his mother and father and had dreams of becoming a doctor. He left school at 15 and got a job on a cargo ship. Six months later, he returned home and took a series of jobs. At age 16, he joined the Navy and learned how to use a submachine gun. He committed his first major theft at 20 years old when he broke into a laundrette, took a heavy safe, cracked it open and found 5,000 Swedish crowns, which is not 6,000 euros that I have on here. I think it's a lot right. more than that. <laughs> um, but anyway, back to the bank. So, one of the women who Bo Nilsson, the bank employee, had tied up was Kristin Enmark. Kristin was a 23-year-old and she had been working at the bank for three years, but she was planning to take up a career in social work. As she was tied up, she was afraid of what might happen to her. Would the crazed gunman make an example of her or would the police rush in and open fire? She started to think about her childhood and her family, as would anyone in that situation. Yeah. Yana had chosen Kristen and two other women on purpose because they were young women and it was likely that they would be spared if the police came in, especially if they were right beside him, as the police wouldn't shoot him, putting them at risk. All the while, Morgan's gun remained concealed under his jacket. Sven Torander, chief of Stockholm's Homicide and Violence Squad, was sitting at his, at his desk when he heard the alarm. He immediately went to the bank, where other officers updated him and warned him to keep back. Then he was told that the robber wanted to speak to him. He used the side entrance of the bank to enter and spoke to Ingemar... V oh God, you have, you're going to have to repeat his name. <laughs> Ingemar Vapperfelt. The injured officer. He then went down the staircase to the lobby. Torander noticed Morgan Relander, who confirmed that he was a police officer. The gunman, Janne Olsen, then gave him permission to come forward. He was told to remove his jacket and show that he didn't have any weapons, which he actually didn't. Torander thought he sounded American, not Arabic like some other officers did. Janne asked the women who were tied up to translate Swedish to English to keep the rumours of him being a foreign terrorist going. His gun was Swedish made, but used in American Special Forces during the Vietnam War. The radio then started playing the news of the bank robbery, which is why Yana had brought it into the bank in the first place. A policeman being interviewed revealed that Torander had entered the bank to try and negotiate with the gun-wielding crazed man. Yane again demanded Clark Olofsson be brought to the bank and gave a deadline of two hours. However, realising that that could be a little bit tight, he gave the police an extra 30 whole minutes. He's so generous. Great stuff. <laughs> if the police fell short, Yane warned that he would start shooting the hostages. So, did Yane know Clark Olofsson? Yes. Yes, he did. They met a few months before the robbery in Kalmar Prison on the Baltic Sea coast. Yane was serving time when Clark started his in an adjacent cell. Yane admired how smart Clark was and he enjoyed his humour and the tales of his criminal life. He thought Clark was charming and he wanted to be his friend. Sorry. Ah, oh, <laughs> crime friend. Crime friend. They started talking about heists and Yane had furlough on the 2nd of August in 1973, which was a perfect time to try and help Clark escape prison. They had made a plan to smuggle in dynamite, a battery, blasting caps and wires and to hide them in the ventilation of the workshop until the explosives could be placed in Clark's cell window. They arranged for a friend to call the prison to ask to speak to Clark, forcing a guard to go to his cell. The plan was then for Clark to subdue the guard, set off the explosive in the window, and then jump out and escape. Yanni would be waiting in a car, and they would get a ferry to the island Orland? Erland. Erland. And stay there until Yanni's brother, 
Åke. 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 Sorry, guys. <laughs> Could take them to the continent. I, I, th- I hope I only have to say that name once. I think I do. Uh, um, uh, oh, no. No. Okay. No, I'm only kidding. <laughs> Maybe once or twice, but... Oh, I've, yeah, I feel like I've, it's not going to be the last time. <laughs> anyway, so that was the plan. But on the 6th of August, the plan failed. The wires used to connect the battery to the blasting caps weren't long enough. Clark improvised by going to the next room and closing the door with the motion causing the blasting caps to come away from the charge. The detonator ignited, but the window was undamaged. So he made a run for it with a knife towards the exercise yard and tried to climb the fence, but he was caught by the guards. He was then sent to a more secure prison in... No shopping. Yeah, that. (laughs) Yana went to Stockholm and stayed with Clark's pregnant girlfriend They got on well together during Yana's two-week stay They went to restaurants and watched films One of them being The Getaway Where Steve McQueen plays a convict on the run And decides to rob a bank and take hostages and manages to succeed Yana and Clark's girlfriend then went to look at banks And chose Credit Banken as the ideal place for his plan to get Clark out of jail So going back to the 23rd of August, 1973, Sven Torander made a call to his supervisor, Superintendent Dag Haldin. Dag Haldin, yeah. To talk about Jano's demands. However, there was no answer. He then called the chief of police, Kurt Lindroff, but he wasn't there either. So he then tried the Minister of Justice, Lennart Geyer, and he got through to his assistant. Torand explained to Yano that the decision to release Clark couldn't be made by himself but the Justice Department. Torand offered to get refreshments and each time he entered the lobby he had to show he wasn't armed. One of the women tied up a cigarette... No, sorry. <laughs> tied up... Oh my God. I was, uh, anyway. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Right. One of the women who was tied up asked for a cigarette and Torander gave one of his own, along with his lighter, which Yane picked up and put in his pocket. Morgan Relander took the job of trying to keep Yane calm. He would sing and whistle without reaction from Yane. Meanwhile, outside, many journalists and TV crews were gathering and creating a massive crowd outside Credit Pankin, reporting on the bank robbery. Radio Sweden, which was a manager of Sweden's only two television stations, was in the area to cover the expected death of the 90-year-old king, King Gustav VI Adolf. A journalist, Bo Holstrom, was at the scene. He was Sweden's first TV foreign correspondent and covered the 1963 train robbery in London and NASA's Apollo 11 landing on the moon in America. He was in Stockholm to attend a conference, but heard news of the robbery and decided to go to the bank straight away. He stayed for the entire duration of the bank robbery and was on screen nearly 24-7 across Sweden over the next few days. So, understandably, members of the public were fascinated and crowded round the bank as well, as this sort of crime was unusual in Sweden. Morgan Relander realised that a woman had collapsed and asked the gunman, Yanni, if an ambulance could be called for her and others that were lying down. Yane decided to let them out. Meanwhile, a reconnaissance unit had set up in a newsagent nearby where they could see the gunman inside the bank. At 11.30am, the robber and the woman he kept beside him as a shield disappeared from sight. Yane had moved towards the customer vault, up the stairs from the lobby. He left Kristin Enmark and her colleague Elizabeth Aldgren near on the la- nearby on the landing. Elizabeth had worked at the bank for a year. She was the youngest of the hostages at 21 years old, and she wanted to be a nurse. The third woman tied up was Birgitta Lundblad, who was 31 years old, and she had worked at the bank for six months. She had two young daughters and was working at the bank part-time because of this. She was ordered to take Yane's bag into the vault, 
Out of the three, she was the most nervous about the crazed gunman and worried about not seeing her family again. Although all three women worked at the same bank, they didn't know each other very well. More police officers managed to get into the building. With Yane becoming impatient, Toranda decided phoning the prison so he could speak to Clark himself. Toranda was hoping their conversation would reveal who the gunman was, and he was waiting to hear back from the Justice Department and the Stockholm Police. Kurt Lindroth and Dag Haldin were on their way to the bank. He managed to speak to the prison, who said they would phone back. It was a long wait for Thorander. Then he saw two police officers wearing bulletproof vests and holding submachine guns. He realised he was in the line of fire and, I guess for the first time, felt quite frightened. Eventually, the prison called back. Clark was having lunch at the time and he was interrupted by a warden, which was very unusual, so he knew something was up and he was taken to the warden's office. He had no idea what this was about. The guard in the office was listening intently to Clark's call with the gunman, but it seemed that Clark didn't recognise him straight away and thought it was a journalist making a joke. As the gunman said, Do you want to come to my party in Stockholm? He admitted later that he knew it was Yano, but he didn't want the police to know. The guard then explained to Clark about the bank robbery and the demand for his release. The Justice Minister, Lennart Geyer, allowed the police to take Clark to the bank just in case things kicked off and lives were lost. However, Clark could only enter the bank if the gunman released the hostages. The police were stalling and hoped that Yeno would surrender or make a mistake so they could shoot him. Snipers were placed on balconies and rooftops of the nearby buildings. There were pictures that show the setups. So there were photographers right next to the snipers, which must have been quite thrilling for them. They were taking the same shots. Yeah, (laughs) as the... Sorry? They were taking the same shots. Oh, Oh my God, that just went right over my head. (laughs) I'm so tired. Oh, God, my partner would be proud of that joke. (laughs) Mine too. (laughs) As he's a photographer... Uh, yeah, that's true. You both are. So, yeah. <laughs> good one. <laughs> Clark didn't know whether to tell the police that he knew who the gunman might be or not, in case they suspected that he was actually involved in planning the robbery. Having received approval from the Justice Department, Clark was released. While being transported, he spoke of his 21 year old fiance, Maria Valin who lived in Gothenburg, while dodging questions from the officers in the van about the robbery and the crazed gunman. Then the officers said there could be a chance to shorten his six-year sentence and get more time out on good behaviour. Clark, understandably, liked the sound of spending less time in prison. Kurt Lindroff, the chief of police, arrived at the bank tasked with saving hostages and finding out who the gunman was. Investigators had an idea that the man was Kai Robert Hansen, an associate of Clark's, and on the run from the authorities. So seven months prior, in January 1973, Clark and Kay were in Gothenburg and robbed a bank. They then went to a hotel an hour outside the city where Kay accidentally left a bag with a loaded gun on the bed, which was found by the maid. Kay then later left a message for Clark at the hotel and left his real name and phone number. Both of them were arrested and Kay's sentence was four and a half years. On July the 2nd, 1973, Kay escaped prison. He pretended he was sick and persuaded guards that he needed medical attention and was sent to the hospital where he climbed out of a window. Ah, yeah, that sounds familiar. Yeah. <laughs> He's been reading Sabraj's book. <laughs> He's travelled to the future and back. <laughs> or there, there must be some sort of telepathy where they're sharing their escape ideas. Yeah, it's all that Buddhist meditation shit. <laughs> yeah. He went to Lund where he was caught on security cameras robbing another bank without disguise. He went into the bank to cash check, but the bank employee recognised him and refused to which Kai demanded the entire cash register. At least Sabraj would be using uh, disguises made out of his own hair. Yes. 
if he was going to go and rob a bank. Yeah, and he wouldn't give his real name. Yeah, no. See, that was a rookie mistake. Yeah. Back to the 23rd of August. The police at Credit Banken believed that Clark's help and his friends with who they believed was Kai would help in calming the gunman's dangerous and unpredictable behaviour. As the deadline for the police to get Clark to the bank was nearly up, they decided to give the ransom over, but only part of it. Toranda chose psychiatrist Dr Niels Bayerot to carry the money into the lobby to Yana. Yana then instructed Morgan to cut open the bag to confirm there was money inside, and it was, but as they were brand new banknotes, Yana knew they could be traced. So he demanded they be changed for old ones and for his friend Clark to be sent to the bank. Yana let some of the hostages leave the bank. Elizabeth, Christine and Birgitta were allowed to go to the bathroom one at a time, unchaperoned and on their way back to the vault, saw police officers hiding with weapons and protective clothing. Yana was becoming impatient as the money and Clark were still not at the bank. He ordered Morgan to do something and threatened him with his gun. Morgan just acted calmly. Then Clark arrived in Stockholm at the police station in Kungsholmen and was escorted to Sven Torander's office. There was a folder on the desk labelled K. Robert Hansen. Clark then realised that the police thought the gunman in the bank was Kai. He didn't want to react to it in front of the police so pushed the folder aside. The phone rang and it was Torander calling from inside the bank who told Clark that he would be getting a call from the robber in the bank. Clark was suspicious and knew the police would be listening and recording the call. He confirmed with Yana that he had arrived in Stockholm and that he was coming to the bank and that the call was being recorded. Sven Torander, Kurt Lindrop and Dr Niels Beirut were at the bank when Clark arrived. His handcuffs were removed and he was offered refreshments. Torander wanted Clark's help to save the hostages, but Clark didn't let on that he knew the gunman's true identity. As news of Clark's arrival reached Janne via the news on the radio, he started to strangle one of the hostages while demanding that Clark be brought to him straight away. Yoni Jonsen, a young detective inspector, asked Clark if he would cooperate and he agreed. Without the say-so from the Justice Department, police officers took Clark towards the staircase. An officer asked him if he knew the gunman, to which Clark replied that he did, and he was very volatile. Regarding the strangling of one of the hostages, it was discovered later that it didn't happen. Elizabeth, Christine and Birgitta denied it, and also Morgan Rielander said that it never happened. Letting Clark into the lobby was a gamble for the Stockholm police. Clark could use his charm to talk to the gunman into surrendering and help free hostages or he might team up with the gunman and make the situation worse. Clark spotted Morgan Rielander in the lobby and asked him if he was a police officer. Morgan said he was and was then told to leave as there were too many cops inside the bank. Morgan was unsure whether he should obey or not, but he left the bank. Clark started looking around for the gunman. When Clark spotted him, he was unrecognisable. His hair was longer and bore little resemblance to the Yana he knew in prison. Then Yana said a code word to Clark and they hugged and walked off so nobody could hear them. Both Clark and Yana would later claim that Clark told Yana that the police tried to bribe him into helping the gunman surrender. Clark never revealed Yana's identity and kept the police thinking that it was Kai Robert Hansen. The ransom money had arrived at the bank and Clark put the bags of cash into the vault. They only contained half of the amount demanded which pissed Yana off. Clark then went to talk to the police. Lindroth and Torander were hoping that they could wear down the rubber by stalling. Meanwhile, they increased their weaponry and hunting rifles from the Coast Guard, good for hitting precise targets at short range. They loaded the guns with dum-dum bullets, which expand and fragment upon impact. The Hague Convention banned these in 1899 due to the suffering they caused, but the police used them mainly on moose or large animals injured in traffic accidents. Morgan Rielander was outside watching through the bank's windows. Clark and the gunman were talking when he saw a door keep opening and closing. He thought he could use this to re-enter the bank without being spotted, 
He decided to go for it and spotted Torgny Valstrom and bank employees who had been hiding since the robbery started. Morgan quietly led them outside with snipers watching them in case the robber spotted them. The gunman was calmer in Clark's presence. He was free to roam around the bank. He was looking for police officers getting inside the bank and when he found them he ordered them to go out, an order that was passed down from the chief of police. But that was not true. However, many police officers obeyed, and within five minutes, the lobby was clear. Clark set up a door alarm made of ropes and bottles, so that if anyone tried to get in, the bottles would crash to the ground. Clark then started to raid drawers and found wads of cash. However, he was unsuccessful at opening a cash register, which had automatically locked when the employees pressed the alarm. Clark and Yenna found more money elsewhere and started to pile it in the corner of the vault. All the while, Yana was getting calmer, and so were the hostages, with Clark showing confidence and his humorous side. They moved into the vault, Yana, Clark and the three women who were tied up, as they were worried about getting shot by the snipers. Once in the vault, Clark asked one of the women tied up if they had eaten, to which she said it was hard to do with her hands tied up. Clark then asked Yana if it was necessary to have women tied up, to which he agreed that the ropes could come off. Clark used his charm and humour to help calm the frightened hostages. He offered the hostages a chance to speak to their families and went to find a phone. Birgitta couldn't get through to her family. Elizabeth and Christine managed to speak to theirs. They were grateful to Clark and Yana who gave them a chance to put their family's worries aside, something the police didn't offer. When he first heard about the gunman in the bank, Clark assumed that Yana had failed to carry out the robbery and decided to take hostages out of desperation. But as Clark learned more about Yana's plans, he realised that Yana had from the very beginning planned to take hostages. Clark was concerned about Yana's plans and how well thought out they were. He believed that releasing the first few hostages was a mistake and they didn't have much to play with in terms of getting a deal with only three hostages. Clark would often walk around the ground floor of the bank to check if there were more police. He came across Sven Serfstrom, a temporary bank employee who was hiding in one of the supply rooms. Clark took Sven back to the vault, but Yana suspected he was a police officer. Clark encouraged Yana to keep Sven as a hostage to help strengthen their negotiating position with the police. Clark and Yana step outside the vault to talk. Yana was speaking Swedish, which surprised the women hostages as they had been asked to translate the Swedish news on the radio for him. Remember, the police still don't know who Yana was. Yana then started talking to Sven and found out about his time in the military and training with submachine guns. Yana then gave Sven his gun and pointed the barrel at his own stomach and dared Sven to shoot, but Sven wasn't a killer. Yana was still waiting for the ransom money, which he had requested in foreign currency, which would be harder to trace. He also wanted two guns and a fast car and two hostages to accompany himself and Clark, who would be released once they were safely away. Clark went out of the vault into the lobby and took a cassette out of the security camera, which was then burnt, using the cigarette lighter that Sven Torander had given to the hostages. At 6.30... A group of snipers from the Stockholm police managed to get inside the bank. Officers Carl Gunnar Ostrom and Lars Erik Carlsen went to the lobby. They had a clear line of fire to where Yana was standing, but Clark spotted the officers and alerted Yana, who shot his gun towards them. The bullets ricocheted off a clothes hanger and nearly hit Carlsen. The shooting inside concerned the police outside regarding the public safety as a huge crowd of people were continuing to gather to catch a glimpse of the action inside the bank. Clark used the phone inside the bank to contact people he knew worked for the press. Orsa Merbury worked for Afton Bladet, a left-leaning tabloid. Clark said that the atmosphere inside the bank was calm and invited Orsa to come down to the bank and see for herself. But she lived an hour and a half away and Clark then dismissed the idea. She asked to speak to the gunman and was granted an exclusive interview. She asked him who he was and what his motives were. He said this was all in aid of inmates inside the harsh prisons who were being victimised. Also told him that it didn't look like that was his message from the outside, especially since he asked for a ransom 
Clark then took over the interview and hammered the point that because of how oppressive the correctional system is, it leads to inmates being violent and conducting acts like this. Violence leads to violence. Also wrote her article the next day, which painted a sympathetic view towards Clark and the gunman. You've got to hand it to Clark. He's just been released from prison, not really having a clue what's going on, except that his mate has hostages in a bank and he's kind of just taken over the situation. Yeah, but he's a career criminal. Yeah. He's been doing this for years. So, and it's it's like what he said, if uh, if you don't risk anything, then you don't gain anything. Yeah, he's like got the police in the palm of his hands. Yeah. And calling journalists. <laughs> yeah. He's kind of taken over the show. Yeah, he takes over more of the show as it goes along. Yeah. Right, you're going to have to help me pronounce this one. I know we've got an abbreviation for him. Ben, ben Toloff. Bengt Olof Levenler. I've got to psych myself up for every new name that I have to <laughs> pronounce, by the way. <laughs> so the police brought in Ben Olof Leven. Oh my God. <laughs> Bengt. Bengt Olof Levenler. Is that, is that umlaut over uh, the O? Uh. Levenler? Uh-huh. Okay. <laughs> ben, I want to get this right. Bent Olof Levenlo. Yeah. It's not right, but it's the closest you're going to get. <laughs> the police brought in Bent Olof Levenlo. Sorry, Swedish listeners or anyone who speaks Swedish. Anyway, known as Bio. That is much better for me to pronounce. As a negotiator, Bio informed the gunman that their fast car that they had requested had arrived. It was a Ford Mustang with a V8 engine. The deal from Bio was that Clark and the gunman would be given the car and safe passage in return for the hostages. Yane thought the police were bluffing and that they would surrender to his demands eventually as they wouldn't want to put the lives of the hostages at risk and the government wouldn't have wanted that either, especially since Olof Palmer was getting ready for a close election. The police planned to give the Ford Mustang to Clark and Yane with only a gallon of petrol. They tampered with the gauge so that it would show as being full, and they attached a tracking device. The vehicle belonged to a police officer. Yeah. Poor man. <laughs> yeah, but the only reason why um, he gave it over was because they wouldn't have been able to get a, a fast car like that at a drop of a hat. So that would have been, probably would have been his like midlife, you know, like men, some men get midlife crisis cars. Yeah. So that could have been his midlife crisis investment. Yeah, we're not being sexist at all. No. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what I mean? Yeah. Like they get to a certain age and they think I've sorted in life, I'm going to treat myself. Yeah, I'm going to splurge all my cash on this fast beauty. So, you know, this is this was probably his midlife crisis fast car investment and now he has to hand it over to to criminals. criminals. Yeah. And not only that, his colleagues have tampered with it. <laughs> that must have hurt him to the soul. I think it's something they can rectify though. Maybe. <laughs> in addition to this, there were roadblocks set up and police forces in bordering towns were on standby along with police watching the airports some airlines cancelled and rerouted their flights to, in Stockholm as they feared the robbers may take control of one of their airplanes. Rerouted? That's extreme. Sorry? You say routed? Oh my God. Yeah, I don't know why I said that. I've been listening to too many Americans. Rerouted? Sounds weird. That's that yeah, that's how I would say it though. I know, it's the British way of saying it. I don't know why I'm saying it. That is the English way. That is, I know. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I'm, I'm taking the piss, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what accent I want to talk in. It's too, too multi multicultural in here. <laughs> Sound like a Brexiter. <laughs> Clark called another journalist, Drew Johansson, at Dagen's Nieheter. He told Rune that both of them were getting on well with the hostages and that the three women wanted to leave the bank with them in the Mustang. Then the call cut off due to the police tampering with the line, but he called Rune back anyway. He asked for Olaf Palmer's telephone number. Clark called Dagens Nieta again and asked for an intermediary. 
Journalist Matt Lundegaard arrived and was escorted inside the bank. He met Toranda and Lindroth inside and told them his plans to see the robbers. Toranda didn't like this and told Lundegaard to get out of the bank. The police viewed the situation could only be resolved if the gunman surrendered or if he was killed. The police asked the robbers and the hostages if they wanted any food. They put in an order and the food arrived shortly after. In addition, six bottles of beer were handed to them, but no one had asked for these. Clark wanted the hostage Sven to taste the beer in case they were spiked. However, Yane took one of the bottles, shook it and listened. There was a faint fizz, which indicated that the bottles had been opened. Lindroth and Toranda later stated that the beer was tampered with and Dr. Beirut had obtained a drug from the pharmacy. At 10.55pm, the women hostages wanted to speak with Toranda. Kristen and Elizabeth said that they wanted to leave with Clark and Yane. Toranda said that could not happen and started arguing with Clark who mentioned how nervous the gunman was becoming and that anything could happen. Later on, Clark managed to speak with Olaf Palmer and expressed their want of leaving the bank with the two hostages, Kristen and Elizabeth. Palmer said that Clark should talk Yana into surrendering and freeing the hostages. Yana then took the phone and threatened to kill the hostages if their demands were not met, but offered Palmer to come to the bank and take the hostages' place instead. Clark, Yana and the hostages spent the night in the vault, with Elizabeth sitting in an armchair near the vault entrance. Yane also placed explosives in case the police tried to ambush them in the night. The police were growing impatient and had a plan to shoot Yane. They hoped by triggering Clark's alarm system of bottles in the lobby would cause Yane to come running out without the hostages acting as his shield. But this didn't work. Clark came out instead and just fixed the alarm. On Friday the 24th of August, Radio Sweden and the evening papers had named the gunman to be Kai Hansen and his picture was circulated in the media. The police decided to send Kai's 17-year-old brother Dan into the bank, accompanied by one of Kai's school friends and the psychiatrist Dr. Beirut. Dan made his way to the lobby, shouting that he wanted to speak to his brother. They were met with gunfire. Beirut encouraged Dan to try again, but the same thing happened. He then tried himself, but was warned off with a shot above his head. Clark came out and warned them to get out. Dan, Bayrot and Kai's school friend went back to the police HQ set up on the second floor when the phone rang. The caller asked to speak to Dan. It was Yanni who said that Kai wasn't at the bank. Dan knew that it wasn't his brother and told the police that they had wrongly identified the gunman. Kurt Lindroth, the chief of police, asked to see the hostages after not hearing anything from them all night. Clark brought each hostage out, one at a time. Lindroth noticed how the hostages were not frightened or angry at their captors. They even played games and poker with them. Kristen would later say that she was afraid the police would shoot them by mistake or cause a shootout. She also felt ignored by the police, who wouldn't say anything to her or listen to her. But Clark had engineered this. He revealed years later that he instructed the police not to talk to the hostages. Bayrot told Clark that Olaf Palme and his government wouldn't change their minds in allowing the hostages to leave with him and Yane. This was also mentioned again by Bio, the police negotiator, who was confronted by Clark, who said the gunman was getting impatient and he could blow up the bank with his explosive. Bio didn't know what the gunman had taken into the bank with him, so he thought it was a bluff which he told Clark, but then Clark got a lump of explosive dough to show him that he was serious. The numbers of journalists and other press agents grew outside the bank in the square. This was at a time when the news was becoming a source of entertainment and false stories and rumours were beginning to spread. This ongoing media coverage put increasing pressure on the police. Gunnar Fagerström, a Radio Sweden journalist, managed to call the phone in the bank and wanted to talk to Clark and the gunman. They discussed the government's recent decision to allow Clark and Yane to leave with just one hostage. The journalist also spoke with Kristen, who expressed the government was acting cowardly and that she didn't want to leave without Elizabeth, and Elizabeth didn't want that either. She told the journalists that they were not afraid of their captors, that she trusted them, and accused the media of sensationalising the situation. 
Yane decided that it was too risky to be outside the vault, given the amount of armed police there were in the lobby and elsewhere in the building. He decided that nobody could leave the vault, not even to use the bathroom. Elizabeth suffered with claustrophobia, and so Yane tied a rope around her neck, a 30-foot leash. She was grateful to Yane, and just felt glad to be outside the vault. That's a bit weird. Isn't it? Not sure how being in a vault, getting claustrophobia, and then having something around my neck would make me feel any better in that situation. Yeah, I don't understand it either. If it made her feel better, it made her feel better. Even though they were told by Kai's brother that the gunman was not Kai Hansen, the police still didn't believe it. Kai's mother did an interview on the radio, which was heard in the vault. She was told by both the police and the media that her son was behind the whole thing and was pleading with him to stop and give himself up. Yane then decided to take off his disguise, which revealed his true face to the hostages for the first time, which Sven, the male hostage, later commented that it looked kind and unthreatening. Clark and Yane were still hoping the Prime Minister Olaf Palme would help them. They encouraged Kristin, the hostage, to phone Palme to see if it would change things. She told the Prime Minister that she was disappointed in him and that she had been a lifelong supporter of his party, the Social Democrats. She mentioned that she trusted both Clark and the gunman and was not afraid of them. She relayed the earlier demands of guns, foreign currency and safe passage. She begged him to let her and Elizabeth accompany Clark and the gunman out of the bank, but Palme said that the risks were too great and said, Would it not feel good to die at your post? Palme later said that this never happened and it is not in the tape recording, but Clark and Yane said that it did. However, there were several minutes of the call missing in the transcript and the police surveillance team have never denied it either. Bit dodge. It is a bit, yeah. Not a great look. No, it's not, especially when you've got an election coming up. She's not going to vote for you. <laughs> no, and I guess for from his perspective, A, he's got these elections coming up. Maybe he thought, I really don't want to be dealing with this. And, you know, if she did die, they probably would have spun it as like, she died for her country, kind, I don't know. Yeah. But it's a really shitty thing to say to someone. It is a bit, yeah. Especially when they're, like, terrorised. Yeah, they, she's stuck in a vault. Yeah. With... Even though she feels comfortable with the with, with Clark and Yana, she's still terrified the police are going to shoot her and the others. Yeah, and, like, when you hear the Prime Minister doesn't would rather you die, surrender yourself and die, then give in to the demands of the gunman and Clark. Yeah, it's not a great look. No. The feeling inside the vault was of optimism and hope that Olaf Palme might call the police to stand down. Clark was still unsure of what Yane's plans were for their getaway. He knew the Mustang wouldn't have a full tank of petrol like the police promised. He came up with a plan to use the Mustang to drive through the city, lose the police and force another car off the road and swap vehicles. But the police were not giving up and their presence was ever stronger inside and outside the bank. Yane was growing frustrated and came to the conclusion that he was going to have to shoot someone. But who? Yane chose Sven, but he said that he would only graze him with a bullet in the thigh and he would do it in front of the police near the chat staircase. Sven agreed as it was the only way to get the police to listen. He said... I thought it was very human. In this desperate situation, he could have hurt me even more. Clark informed the media that this demonstration was going to take place at 7pm, but he didn't say exactly what. At 7.30pm, something surprising happened. A police officer on the chat staircase had fired his gun by accident into the wall. The lobby filled with smoke. From outside, it looked like something serious had happened to one of the hostages, but Yana had changed his mind about shooting Sven. He couldn't face it. The blast made a hole in one of the locked cash registers, so Clark and Yane were happy about that. Yane did an interview for Actuelt and explained his side of what had so far happened in the robbery. He did not disguise his voice, however, which caused Kai Hansen's mother to call the police and tell them it wasn't her son who was the crazed gunman in the bank. As the stalemate continued between Clark, Yane and the police, 
they spent another night in the vault. Yeah, about the police officer firing his gun by accident, a lot of them had been on really long shifts. So a lot of them were like sleep deprived and Yeah, and if a crime like this hasn't happened before or things like that didn't happen often, you know, some of these police officers or most of them would never have been in that situation before themselves. Yeah. So that would have been really stressful. Yeah. There are conflicting stories about what happened next inside the vault. There were rumours of sexual assault between Yana and one of the hostages that had circulated. This all came to light during the trial. When asked about it later, Yana stated that him and the hostage spoke about life in prison and how long it had been since he had last had sex. The hostage apparently held him and started to kiss him and it escalated to oral sex. The hostage wanted to go further, but Yana stopped it before it did. The hostage, however, claimed something different. Yana spoke about how long it had been since he last saw a woman and asked for a hug. The hostage thought that if she could develop some sort of intimacy with Yana, then she might be able to encourage him to surrender. Fully clothed, she let Yana touch her breasts and hips, and he wanted to take things further. She stopped him and suggested he take matters into his own hands. There were traces of semen discovered on a piece of paper found under a table in the vault. Well, I wasn't expecting that when I read the book. (laughs) Yeah. Can't believe I had to talk about semen then. Yeah. Do you know what? This whole vault situation, it makes me think of money heist. Yeah. Probably um, were inspired. Heavily... Yeah, heavily influenced. Especially because, though, don't two of the characters fall in love in the vault? Yeah. I forgot their names. Yes, me too. I forgot what countries each of them... Is it countries or cities? What cities each of them? Is it Bas? Denver. Denver. Denver um, and... It's not Barcelona, is it? No. Stock. It's not Stockholm. No. Oh, God. Someone's going to be listening to this and they're going to be screaming it. Yeah. <laughs> In their heads, us. But yeah, two of them, perpetrator and a hostage, fall in love in a vault. Yeah. And, so and they have they, a kid together. They have a kid. Oh, no, but it's not his, is it? No, she's already pregnant. Yeah, that's right. If if you haven't watched Money Heist, sorry for spoiling it, but yeah. do go watch it. It's yeah. very good. Go watch it after this podcast. <laughs> yeah. At 1.50am, the police attempt to move things along. Morgan Rielander shot a wooden bench in the lobby in the hopes of getting the gunman's attention and then shoot him with when in range, but nothing happened. The police had done some research and made another guess that the rubber was Yana Olsen, although he didn't seem the type. He wasn't violent, and he despised those who hurt both women and children. The psychiatrist Beirut concluded that the crisis would have a non-violent conclusion, as the rubber had spent so much time with the hostages, and a bond of friendship would have developed. But that's quite a confident... I want to say diagnosis to give to the police because he doesn't really know like anything could have happened. Yeah, and what is he going by to draw these conclusions? Especially if you look at other, if you want to call it terrorist situations, where like he doesn't know for sure if the hostages are in like are being treated well in there. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, but uh, to be at the same time, he's not far wrong either. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, he's he's a pretty friendly um captor, I guess, compared to yeah other people. Yeah, the police decided to believe Beirut and planned to lock Clark and Yana inside the vault. It was a huge gamble, and it meant putting the lives of the hostages at risk. They managed to lock the vault door to Yana's surprise who started throwing metal safety deposit boxes at the door and was shouting. Yana warned the police that if they tried to storm the vault, then they would be met with explosives. The police strengthened their defences by placing sandbags against the vault door. They took control of the telephones and disconnected the outgoing line in the vault. To confirm the rubber's identity, the police dusted food items left lying around of fingerprints, but Yana had been wearing gloves. They installed a microphone in the ventilation system leading to the vault so they could hear everything that was said. The police negotiator, B.O., asked Clark and Yana if they were ready to surrender. Yana asked permission for the hostages to call their families, 
but B.O. said that he had already spoken to them and said they were fine. Kurt Lindroff, the police chief, called a meeting on the second floor of the bank, where most of the police were camped out. They had their HQ. He set up a meeting to, to come up with a plan to get Yana and Clark to give themselves up. Yana and Clark threatened that they could stay in the vault for as long as it takes for the police to meet their demands. The government was getting nervous as the general election was three weeks away. The police discounted the idea of drugging the drink and food in case Yana forced the hostages to taste test first. They considered using gas and consulted anesthesiologists, immunologists and chemists, but there wasn't any substance that wouldn't harm the hostages and the safer ones wouldn't be strong enough to sedate Clark and the rubber. However, tear gas was becoming a possibility. The police were playing mind games with both the captors and the hostages by promising food and fang calls to the hostages' families, but not delivering. When they did finally grant access to food and drink, the police refused to pass it through the door and threatened to drill through the ceiling. Yana and Clark said no to this and threatened that if the police tried to storm the vault, then they would shoot everyone. The police were trying to determine the dimensions of the vault to see if the police could drill through the ceiling and deploy the tear gas. A man who was a director for a drilling company contacted the police and offered his services as he had one of the largest core drills in the country. The police agreed to accept his help and let him into the bank with his team. On Sunday morning, a number of ambulances turned up with stretchers and went inside the building. The public and media knew something was about to happen. The rumours that it was Kai Hansen, who was the robber, were put to rest when he called the police from Honolulu. He accidentally told the police that he intended on coming back to Sweden, so they made plans to arrest him. On September 6th, Kai was back in jail. He really doesn't sound like a clever one. <laughs> yeah, he doesn't really learn from his lessons, does he? No. At 9pm on Sunday, the drilling into the vault commenced. Then the microphones picked up something frightening. One of the hostages shouted, Help! Stop! while crying. One officer convinced that Yana was raping the, the woman shouting. But, not considered by the police, Kristen was actually screaming for the drilling to stop. Her cries in Swedish, Sluta Bora, stop drilling, were heard by the police as Sluta Bara, just stop. Yana guessed that the police were drilling holes in the ceiling to let gas in. He decided to make a bomb and place it in one of the ventilation holes. Much later that evening, he informed the police what he had done and threatened to ignite the bomb if they continued to drill and that there were hostages directly underneath where they were drilling. Even the hostages were pleading with the police to stop drilling. The drilling continued and Yana moved the hostages to the other side of the vault. At 11.45pm, there was an explosion and a big piece of concrete fell to where the hostages were before moving. The blast damaged the drill, but the police were able to use another one to continue. The drilling lasted for four hours. A piece of bulletproof plexiglass was put over the hole in case Yana decided to shoot. The negotiator BO gave Yana an ultimatum to surrender. They would pass a wire through the hole to which Yana could hook his gun to. He gave Yana 20 minutes to decide. Yana refused the ultimatum, so the police continued drilling. He pulled out rope from his bag and tied them up into nooses and ordered the hostages to put them over their heads. The ropes were then fastened to the safety deposit boxes on the wall, so that if the police used gas, the hostages would die first. On the phone, Clark accused the police of trying to gas them, but B.O. denied it. But if Yana didn't surrender, then they would drill more holes and possibly use gas. Sven, the hostage, told the police that they had ropes around their necks, but B.O. seemed not to listen and kept asking to speak to Yana. Then B.O. finally realised what Sven was saying. To check it was true, the police slid the plexiglass covering the drilled holes and used a periscope which confirmed that Yana was not bluffing. Kurt Lindroff was unsure of what to do next. It was difficult to predict what Yana and Clark might do. At 4.45am, Kurt spoke to the media in the square, saying that trying to reason with the rubber was impossible and told them that the hostages had nooses around their necks. Kurt also confirmed that Clark had defected from helping the police to being Yana's accomplice. 
Several calls from the public were made to the police with suggestions of what to do next. One suggestion was to play religious music by the Salvation Army to make Yana give up his resistance. That, yeah, that would do it for me. Another person suggested releasing a hive of angry bees into the vault to force the captors to exit. And a third suggested coating the floor outside the vault with soap so that when the vault door opened and the captors stepped out, then they would slide into the arms of the police. I can just imagine all three of those happening and what a hilarious sight that would be. The operator taking those calls. <laughs> How could they do their job seriously? They must afford them on to the psychiatrist. <laughs> it would have been funny to see the soap one, though. I think the bees one would have been quite funny. Could you imagine <laughs> someone in a bee suit carrying a, a nest... <laughs> Yeah, but knowing the police at this point, they would just the the nest would explode somewhere, and they get they get stung, and not the yeah the people inside the vault. Yeah, Yana removed the nooses from the necks of Kristin, Elizabeth, Birgitta, and Sven. Elizabeth built on the relationship between her, Yana, and Clark. They both talked about their time in prison, and the group laughed at some of their stories. Then Elizabeth suggested that they move the cabinets blocking the way of the vault. Stockholm police were being secretive about their next move. This caused speculation in the press and crowds watching outside. Kurt Lindorf and his officers had three options. Place a sharpshooter at the hole in the vault to shoot Janne. Storm the vault through the door by forcing it open or drug Janne's food and drink. However, Janne remained mostly out of sight or had one of the hostages next to him. Storming the vault would take too much time to organise, and in turn play in favour of Yana and Clark to counter-strike, and the entrances and holes in the ceiling could be mined. And as they had already tried to poison Yana, he would be on his guard. The negotiator, B.O., adopted a more friendlier approach and offered them food, drink, toilet paper and tampons, which they had requested earlier. The police decided to take a photograph of the group inside the vault, and the picture proved what they had feared. Just above the hostages, attached to the safety deposit boxes, were the nooses. Clark and Yenna were tossing some of the ransom money into a small fire they had started by using Tor and his lighter. They did this so that the police would think any sums missing from the ransom money or the bank registers had been destroyed, when in fact... They planned to help themselves to as much of it as possible. By 8am on Tuesday the 28th of August, the police had drilled three holes into the vault ceiling. Yana tried blocking the holes using paintings and newspapers. Yana shot his gun through one of the holes as the police were pulling up the drill. The plexiglass had not been placed back properly and one officer was shot while trying to correct it. The bullet entered his finger then went into his cheek and lodged itself into his jaw. Ouch. Yeah, not nice. Olive Palmer was talking to the National Police Chief, Carl Pearson. The Prime Minister was feeling pressure from the public, and the press kept printing sensational headlines. Carl Pearson was prepared to take the risk that the hostages may get hurt. Yana did not trust the police wouldn't poison them, despite what B.O. had said. Why were they drilling multiple holes? Yana told the hostages his theory. Olaf Palmer approved the new plan the police had devised. They were going to use tear gas. Police officers would go inside the vault, defeat Yana and free the hostages. Olaf Palmer stood by any action that meant shooting Yana or Clark. The photograph the police had taken showed the cabinets blocking the entrance to the vault and by using the help of a bank employee on holiday, they were able to calculate the weight of the cabinet. They planned to use a jack to force their way in and a blowtorch for the door hinges if needed. If this failed, they would drill another but bigger hole in the ceiling. Some officers didn't agree with the use of gas. They stood by the exhaustion tactic, which they believed was working. Meanwhile, Yenna was setting up an explosive. The police would have 15 minutes to capture Yenna and Clark and free the hostages from when the gas would be deployed. If it took longer than that, according to the expert, there would be danger for everyone in the vault. The gas would be deployed by aerosol cans, followed by Hawkan Larson and Johnny Johnson entering the vault, armed with sword-off shotguns, 
suitable for close range but illegal in Sweden. These guns were seized from Larsing Svartenbrand, another infamous bank robber. They would also be equipped with knives in order to cut the hostages down from their nooses. At 8.55pm, the police were ready to start their plan. The gas team, drill team and break-in team were waiting for their mark. Just before they were about to start, Clark said something to Yane about throwing explosives at officers on the other side of the vault door. The signal was given by the police and the drilling started again. The ventilation fan stopped and a spotlight lit up the vault. Yane ordered the hostages back into the nooses but it was too late as the police had already deployed the gas. They got down on the ground gasping for air. The captors and the hostages were screaming to be let out. Håkon Larsson demanded that Yane place his gun on a hook attached to a rope hanging through the ceiling hole. Yane complied. Larsson shouted more instructions but Yane couldn't hear. Elizabeth asked for the police to open the door as the gas was attacking the eyes, lungs and throats. The gas was making its way into the lobby. When Yane's gun was on the rope and being taken through the ceiling, the magazine got stuck. Larson's colleagues were on the other side of the door to the vault and couldn't understand why there was a delay, so they instructed for more gas to be pumped in. By the time the gun was dislodged, the group in the vault had been exposed to the gas for 20 minutes longer than planned. The police were panicking and concerned that Yane might have strapped a bomb to himself. Larson negotiated with Yane for him to hand over his explosives, which he did. The police then demanded that the hostages leave the vault first, but they refused. Yane, Clark and Sven tried to move the steel cabinets blocking the exit of the vault. It had been 30 minutes since the gas was released. Yane then ordered everyone to go back to the vault in case the police started firing. After 121 hours inside the bank, it was finally over. Yane was handcuffed to Håkon Larsson and Johnny Johnson. Elizabeth was escorted out by a police officer. Kristen walked out by herself. Clark was handcuffed to two officers. Birgitta exited next accompanied by two officers and Sven came out last. Clark was then strapped to a stretcher when an officer hit him in the face and put his knee on Clark's thigh. Kristen shouted to Clark that they would see each other again. She also was shouting at the officer to stop what he was doing. Yeah. There's, is that what that picture's from where he's got the um, bruised eyebrow? Uh, it could be, yeah. The group had spent over 30 minutes in the gas, which would have been lethal had the police not bungled up the operation according to one of the scientists. Toranda had placed his men in charge of operating the spraying mechanism after dismissing the experts. Yane was led out of the bank and met a circus of flashing cameras and jeering journalists. He was put in an ambulance, but the paramedics refused to take him as the vehicle res was reserved for one of the hostages. Still handcuffed to Larson and Jonsson, Yane had to go back into the crowd of people hissing and booing. There's video footage of that. You really hear the crowd. Gosh. I mean, it must have been quite an atmosphere. Yeah. I mean, nothing like that has happened in Sweden before. Yeah. And I guess, you know, where it would have been televised more than anything else, that would have had another, a knock-on effect. So more people would have turned yeah. up to the square. Yeah. And it's, you know, how many days? So six days, yeah. Yeah. Clark and the hostages were carried out on stretchers and were driven separately to five different hospitals. Elizabeth was concerned about Yane and Clark and hoped that they would receive the same medical care as her and the other hostages. Yane was accompanied to the hospital with five police officers. He asked about the police officers who he had shot, who were not in a very good condition. Olaf Palmer, the Prime Minister, went to the bank with the National Police Chief, Carl Pershon. When asked by a journalist how Olaf felt, he said that he was relieved like the rest of Swedish society. Janne was transferred to... Kronoberis Hektet. Thank you. A nearby jail to the hospital. Clark was examined at the same hospital that Janne was in. He received a lot of fan mail, approximately 70 telegrams from women with photographs and telephone numbers. I bet Charles would have liked some of that. 
He got his fair share though, didn't he? Yeah, that's true. Yeah. But he didn't get 70 though. I bet he got more. <laughs> Let's not... Yeah, uh, maybe. Mind you, who's in Kathmandu? Mm. So maybe most of it got lost in the airmail. <laughs> Clark had managed to smuggle out some money from the vault, which police never knew about. Clark admitted 40 years later that he managed to hide... 40,000 crown notes, that's 25,000 euros in today's money, in his rectum. Up his bum. Yep. That's where those bribe monies are coming from, people's bum hole. Yeah. It's a good job those <laughs> notes aren't circulating anymore. Yeah. Or not to my knowledge anyway. Yeah. <laughs> well, you never know, because he avoided eating while figuring out how to retrieve the money. And then he managed to retrieve it in the shower. And so he probably rinsed out the notes, hid the notes in a sock and then dried them on his bed. If he was caught with the money, he would have been charged with aggravated robbery. He gave the money enclosed in a letter to his defence lawyer, Olof Arvidsson, who then mailed it to one of Clark's friends. His lawyer thought the letter had already passed the security in the prison, but Clark found an envelope with examined by the prosecutor stamped on it. So does that mean the money went out? Yeah. Oh, okay. Oh. And because it because it had that stamp on the letter, it was it it had been sta- it had been examined and processed. Yeah. So they just let it out. Bum money. <laughs> um <laughs> his shitload. <laughs> yeah. I've got a shitload of money. <laughs> The hostage oh God. The hostages were taken to a psychiatric ward to treat any traumas caused by the event. Kristen suffered from insomnia and would often wake up in the night and want to hold someone's hand. The psychiatrists encouraged the former hostages to talk about the ordeal as much as possible. They also wanted to know if Kristen had fallen in love with Clark. Kristen's and Elizabeth's views of Yane and Clark hadn't changed and they still believed that the police were the real threat. The former hostages were questioned by the police for the pre-trial investigation. They too wanted to know of any intimate relations that went on inside the vault. Elizabeth denied that Yane had threatened them and that he only used them to scare the police. The investigators asked if anyone was raped. Sven, Elizabeth and Kristen strongly denied it. Journalists had been waiting outside the psychiatric hospital where the hostages were taken. Dr. Beirot was asked if Yane had fallen in love with one of the hostages, but the doctor denied it and said that he was only after the money. When asked about if there was a case of rape in the vault, Beirot said that there was no evidence. This wasn't taken as a denial and some newspapers printed that there was no doubt a sexual assault which took place in the vault, while others said that nothing of the sort ever happened. Lennart Jungbeit explained that the hostages were experiencing some sort of shell shock, being that the hostages had no time to prepare for the situation that they found themselves in and were at the mercy of Yane or the police. But Kristen thought Clark saved her life and made her feel feel calmer and she didn't agree with the fact that he was being punished. Um, I was reading an article, I think it's a Swedish website called Femina. Okay, yeah. And she said that because he said that nothing would happen to her while they were in the vault, she believed him. I don't want to butcher the quote, but she said something like she put a halo above his head. Because he was the only one protecting her more than the police. Yeah. In 1974, they started to write to each other with letters becoming more and more intimate and planned to meet in person. Clark received a 24-hour furlough in order to visit his lawyer and both he and Kristen met in a restaurant in Stockholm. On the way back to the prison, he asked Kristen to get on the train with him. When Kristen kissed him, this took a lot of passengers by surprise. They stayed at a hotel in Nurshepping and Clark went back to prison the next day. They remained in contact and in 1974 she visited him twice 
but Clark didn't want to see her in prison anymore and wanted to wait until he received more furloughs. By the end of the 1970s, they renewed their relationship and Kristen asked Clark if he would father her child. He said yes, but on the caveat that he would not be named on the birth certificate and he didn't want anything to do with raising the child. They were successful in getting pregnant, however, it was an ectopic pregnancy. Yane's and Clark's trial began on the 9th of January 1974. All four hostages took the stand, and towards the second week of the trial, Clark fired his lawyer, his second defence lawyer, and decided to represent himself. As the trial proceeded, people started to praise Clark's performance as he showed the complexities of the case, which eluded the prosecution. During the trial, Yane's and Clark's friendship seemed to dissipate, caused perhaps by the dispute over money. Yane later said that he did not receive his share of the 40,000 crowns that Clark had smuggled out of the vault through his bum. March 19th, 1974, Yana was convicted of kidnapping, extortion, attempted extortion, aggravated assault, robbery and possession of an illegal firearm. He received 10 years at a maximum security prison. This added seven years onto his sentence, uh, which he was serving when he fled prison before the robbery. He developed a love of writing in prison and had many pen pals. He married one of them, Gunilla, in 1975. The judge that had sentenced him for the bank robbery performed the marriage ceremony. Officers Kurt Lindroff and Sven Torander and the psychiatrist Dr. Beirut attended the wedding. Lindroff and Torander gave the couple a painting and the psychiatrist gave a speech. They were in support of Yana's rehabilitation. That's some guest list for your wedding, isn't it? Your former, like, prosecutor. Uh, yeah, the people trying to get you out of a bank. Yeah. That you're robbing and shooting and threatening to blow up. <laughs> Yana was released from prison in 1980 for good behaviour. He was determined to break his life for crime. He took odd jobs but missed the excitement of heists. He divorced from Ganilla and in 1989 he married a Thai woman called Fian. They moved to Thailand in 1996 where Yana opened a grocery store and became a Buddhist. What a turnaround. And he probably became an actual Buddhist, unlike Charles Sabraj. Yeah, a, a legit Buddhist. Yeah. According to an article on the SVT news website, the only thing he regretted about the bank robbery was helping Clark Olofsson. In 2011, Jana and Fien moved back to Sweden, where they still reside. In 2018, the author of The Six Days of August, David King, met up with Jana, who showed him photos of his nine children. They discussed how Jana planned the robbery and where he and Clark would have ended up. If they had gotten away, they would have sailed to France. Clark was convicted of being accessory to robbery, an aggravated robbery, and being complicit in extortion. Clark appealed and defended himself, and the court ruled in his favour. He still had to serve the remainder of his sentence. In 1975, he escaped prison in Neuschöping and robbed a bank in Denmark. He ended up in the French Riviera, and then onto the British Isles. In 1976, while being hunted by police, he committed the largest single-person bank robbery in Sweden at Svenska Handelsbanken in Gothenburg. He stole 930,000 crowns, but was caught in a hotel bar. Three quarters of the money was never recovered. He escaped prison again later that summer. His friends, who were armed with machine guns, crashed a truck through the prison gates and took him and three other prisoners away to, to a getaway car. The media, of course, followed this drama. Clark spent the next 40 years in and out of prison. In 1991, he was released and changed his name. He moved to Belgium and married the daughter of a prominent businessman. In 1998, he was arrested on suspicion of smuggling amphetamines into Denmark. He was released in 2005, but arrested three years later in Sweden, for smuggling drugs from Holland. 
In 2018, he was released from prison and the author David King went to see him at his home address. Clark spoke about the bank ordeal and laughed at the police for allowing him inside the bank. In 2022, a Netflix drama was released retelling Clark's life through crime. As for the hostages, Birgitta was the first to leave the psychiatric ward and the first to give an in-depth interview. She believed the ordeal inside credit banking made her a stronger person. She returned to work there in October 73 and retired in 2003. Sven also returned to credit banking. He also visited Jana in prison. He saw Clark by chance in a nightclub. He retired in 2011 and pursued a career in home decoration and design and was a finalist in the Swedish Design Awards. Elizabeth and Christian continued their friendship. Elizabeth left the bank shortly after the robbery. She often had nightmares about the robbery. She gave interviews and spoke about her experiences. However, this became too much and did not want to be contacted by the media anymore. She returned to school and retrained as a nurse. Kristin returned to work at the bank for a little while, but found it more difficult than expected. She would avoid the lobby and loud noises and particular sights would induce panic. Kristin disagreed with the police's use of gas and regarded it as attempted murder. She never liked the term Stockholm Syndrome, as it made her feel like she was considered sick, had done something wrong or blamed for something. In 1974, she took a degree in social work, specialising in psychotherapy and now runs the therapy practice in Stockholm. She also stayed friends with Clark after their relationship ended. Oh, so they remained in contact? Yeah, so they, they stopped being an item, um, but they stayed friends. Wow, okay. That was in, in the same article that I read, um, and it was quite a recent article. I think it was written last year. Oh, okay. Dr. Niels Berrit was credited for inventing the name of the condition the hostages were experiencing. It started off as Norman's Tory Syndrome, changing later to Stockholm Factor and then to Stockholm Syndrome. Beirut defined it as a paradox of common interest between hostage taker and his victims arises. This can develop from understanding to sympathy and even lead to the victim developing strong emotional ties to the hostage taker. Beirut said that there was potential for sexual feelings in this captor-captive relationship, feelings that can be so powerful that they last for years after the event or even a lifetime. However, Stockholm Syndrome as a concept was not mentioned by Beirut at all and was not published in his reports or any of the media coverage at the time. So how exactly did the term come about? Dr Frederick J Hacker was a psychiatrist who had been an expert witness at the Charles Manson trial. He also consulted on the Patty Hearst trial where he saw a similarity between her case and those of the hostages in the bank at Norman's Story and so called the phenomenon, the Stockholm Effect. And that's the end of that. Yes. Quite an intense six days. Yeah. With a massive change for those hostages. They were first afraid of the crazed gunman who seemed high off his head and shouting yeah. uh, abuse and explosives. Thinking they might never see their families ever again. Yeah, exactly. And then just to do like a complete 180 and end up trusting the their captors and having all the distrust for the police. One of them going so far as wanting a child with one of the captors, like Kristen. Um, like they just went in to work one day, <laughs> but then they end up in a vault yeah, for six the days. the whole lives have changed. Yeah, but I mean, good on them. They all seem to have come out like stronger people. Yeah. Especially to to those that went back and carried on working in the bank for a significant amount of time. Yeah. But we've we've learned to not trust people wearing blue tinted glasses in a bank and who shout the party has begun. Yeah. Yeah, don't don't trust those people. Yeah. Don't open the door for them. That old lady that opened the door. Don't oh, be her. Yeah. She has so much to answer for. <laughs> <laughs> but like this was a good case to see how much power the the media had at the time and yes that was like a new thing like the the news was becoming entertainment um, rather than you know passing facts on to the public which they actually did compared to today yeah 
And just seeing how misinformation could also spread. Yeah. Fake news. Fake news, yeah. Or like just the police getting it wrong and then that gets into print. Yeah. It's quite um, definitely an interesting one. Yeah. And it leads nicely to the next episode as well. Yes. Which, you know, sorry guys, we're going to stay stay in the 70s. But it does. It doesn't happen that long. Not long after this case. It's the year after. Yeah, literally the year after in America. So two apologies. We're going to America. We we did say we do say in our introduction that we avoid cases in America. But this one couldn't really be avoided because of how relatable it is to this case. And also, we're sticking in the seventies. So bear with us. We're not leaving that decade just yet. <laughs> Yeah, so we're going to cover Patricia Hurst, or Patty Hurst, however you want to call her. So you're going to find out who she is, what happened to her, and what what she's got to do with Stockholm Syndrome. It's going to be a good one. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that. Yeah, when I read the book for this, I thought, oh, this is quite dramatic. And then I learned about Patricia Hurst, and that gets, it's like, woof, <laughs> so much happens. <laughs> It gets a lot more dramatic. I I um heard someone in one of the documentaries say, "Is she just a a rich girl that's gotten bored and decided to take up a life of crime, or is she a real victim?" We're gonna contemplate that in the next part. Yeah. So we'll see you then. No, we'll speak to you then. I don't know. You get to listen to yeah. us then. Good thing is, it's all American names. It's in America. We can pronounce it. Thank the Lord. <laughs> Emma and I won't be like staring at each other cluelessly. <laughs> yeah. And it's quite hard because we, we record at night. Yeah. So our brains are really, really tired and we're having to contend with foreign names. Exactly. But we we are going to have a names list for the... I think we're just going to have names lists for all of our episodes. I yeah. Yeah. So there will be a names list. Yeah, we'll, we'll put in that extra effort for you podders. Just for you guys. We hope you appreciate it. And we hope you join us for part two of episode two, Stockholm Syndrome, Patricia Hurst. Thank you for listening to the show. We hope you enjoyed this episode. You can find more information about the show on our website at feloniouspod.com or on our Instagram, at felonious.pod. Links to our show notes can be found in the episode description, as well as through our website and social media. You can visit our Contact Us page and tell us what you think about the show and if there are any cases you would like us to cover. We hope you join us for the next episode. Goodbye. Bye.